Okay, good afternoon to everyone. Um, thanks for joining in today. Um, this is a one hour webinar where we're going to be discussing ontological security theory and the relationship between the theory and migration studies. Um, and I'm excited to have two guest speakers joining us today, um, Alexandria Innes and Katerina Kinval, um, who are going to speak about their experiences of using the theory um, and the kind of insights that it's brought them and, and the discipline um, throughout their work. Um, so this webinar is part of the Diversity Matters webinar series, which focuses on interdisciplinary research and explores the impacts of migrations, diversities and mobilities. Um, the series is a forum for experts to share their work and expertise with fellow academics, students, decision makers and practitioners. My name is Marcus Nicholson and I'm a postdoctoral researcher here at URAC Research in Bolzano in the north of Italy. Um, I recently completed my PhD at Glasgow Caledonian University in Scotland. Um, which used ontological security theory to look at the lived experiences of young adult migrants um, in Scotland. Um, for anyone who is new to the topic, then um, ontological security is a theory um, which refers to a person's sense of existential safety in the world. Um, and the theory was first used by the psychiatrist uh, R.D. Ling to explain how his patients experienced reality in a way that didn't conform with um, normative experiences. And it was later revisited by Anthony Giddens, who took a more sociological approach um, and emphasized the role of daily routines and social trust uh, in providing individuals with a sense of security. Um, and from its micro level origins um, in psychiatry, like I, I spoke about, um, the scholarship in recent years has mostly come from international relations um, and looking at macro level perspectives of security and how states relate to each other, um, including in moments of conflict. Um, so as I've said, I'm very happy to be joined by two guests today whose work has been really inspiring to me when I've been doing my PhD studies um, and I've spoken with each of them um, about their perspectives on the theory and, and its use. The basic structure for this webinar is to have a short presentation from each of the guest speakers um, before I get the chance to raise some questions of my own. Um, and we have a bit of a discussion in the second part of the hour. And then finally, we'll get some audience questions, which will just have to be written in the chat and then I can read them out and put them to the presenters. Um, so please have a think about some questions to ask um, as the discussion goes on um, and write those in the chat um, when we're, we're ready to go for that. Um, I'll quickly introduce each of the speakers before we see their presentations. Uh, and we'll start with Katerina Kinval who is professor at the Department of Political Science in Lund um, University in Sweden. And her research um, has covered um, the themes of political psychology, migration, multiculturalism, globalization and security, as well as religion and nationalism. And she has a particular focus on South Asia and Europe. Um, and she's the author of many books and articles that deal with ontological security, um, including um, the books uh, Climate Hazards, Disasters and Gender Ramifications, Ontological Insecurity in the European Union, um, and Globalization and Religious Nationalism in India, um, which was the first book um, of Katharina's that I read when I was be beginning my PhD studies. Uh, and I asked each of the presenters to talk a little bit today about how they became aware of the theory um, and brought it into their, their own work. Um, and then also thinking about what it can bring to migration studies. Um, and so that's going to be the focus of our discussion today. So uh, Katerina, if you're happy, we'll um, put the mic over to you and you can um, introduce yourself and um, how you've used the work. Uh, how you use ontological security in your work. Thank you. 
Thank you, Marcus, and thank you all for participating today and for the invitation. Um, yeah, so uh, Marcus has asked us to talk about how we came to the field of ontological security studies, what insight this has brought, and how a focus on ontological security can enrich migration studies. And in the description of the presentation of myself and Andrew, it also says that I will draw on my expertise on the study of minority groups to show how a strong conceptualization of home is key for individuals to develop feelings of ontological security and highlight the role that state level narratives play in this process. So I'm going to try to say something a little bit about both these topics. So I came to ontological security studies, <coughs> excuse me, when I was doing research for my book on Hindu and Sikh nationalism in India in the 1990s. As I was trying to understand what led up to the destruction of the Barbary Mosque by Hindu nationalists in the early 1990s, which is actually now being inaugurated as a temple, and the reasons for the Khalistan movement to emerge, the call for an independent Sikh state a decade later. And at the time I lived in India, I conducted interviews with people across religious, class, gender, caste boundaries in northern India, trying to understand how religious and national identities are formed and form the ways in which we think and act politically. What I, what I kind of soon discovered was that many of those I interviewed lived various lives of insecurity and that those insecurities and the structures and emotions connected to them could be appealed to, could be governed and kind of made emotionally powerful through strong national and religious identification. So, so then I read Lang and Giddens that Marcus talked about as I was trying to make sense of this. So thinking of how India of the 1980s, when the Khalistan movement emerged, went through rapid changes during the Green Revolution, and how the new economic policies of the 1990s, when the Hindu nationalist movement emerged, also created a more fluid and changing society in which national and religious identities increasingly became a kind of recourse. So, so in more specific terms, I became interested in how nationhood and religion become securitized in context of existential doubts and, and then ontological insecurity, and how this is related to more post-colonial and gender space. And at the time, I still thought of ontological security in kind of Giddens terms as security of being, something I later on have kind of changed into thinking about it as a security of becoming, a kind of securitization of subjectivity in which identity dynamics are kind of explicated in social psychological terms. So, so when talking about the securitization of subjectivity, and this has been quite important to my work on migration or my work on, on narratives of migration, I refer to this as a process that seeks to build walls of ontological security around an idea of the self through the refusal to permit ambiguity or problematization in cultures or social structures. So, so, so in other words, it's an attempt to essentialize and merge a notion of self and identity by taking recourse in narrow conceptions of what actually constitutes such self and identities. But, but for, of course, as many of us have argued, the whole idea of a secure, stable self is itself an illusion and relies on fantasies and imaginaries that promises a resolution to past and present crisis. So, so of particular interest for me then was how such dynamic transcends the boundaries of individual self other constructions to define communities and states, and how these dynamics are transformed in times of fear, trauma and crisis. And this also became the topic of another book with Paul Nesbitt Larkin on the political psychology of globalization, where we look at minority groups, especially young Muslims in Europe and Canada, trying to understand the kind of narrative co-construction of ontological insecurity by Islamists on the one hand and by the far right on the other. So, so more generally, this has resulted in a focus on how narrative reconstructions of traumas and collective memory shape collective action and the search for ontological security, and how narrations of traumatic events and practices that attempt to govern these events impact on notions of ontological security. And, and this is also where the politics of memory comes in, and it's very strong in my reading of ontological security, especially as related to various crises of our times, like authoritarian populism, illiberal democracy. So where collective emotions like love for the nation, hate, fear, disgust for the stranger other are central in the narrative constitution and consolidation of collective identities. So they become, in Lacan's terminology, and I have moved in the direction of psychoanalysis, they become the objects onto which fantasies of wholeness are projected to salvage the belief in core identities. So, so in my own work, I particularly looked at how reconstructed memories of nation and religion 
have come to then serve as important narrative imaginations for justifying populist and authoritarian politics in India and Europe, as Marcus was talking about. So in India, where the Muslim minority has become the kind of eternal other, and in Europe, where immigrants in general, and Muslims in particular, have kind of served a similar role. So in these kind of reconstructions, places, spaces, and narratives about certain events offer an important imagined anchors for political leaders invested in attempts to address and pin down unknown anxieties of what the future holds. And this is, of course, the more spatial material term ontological security studies that Philip Adus has talked a lot about. So, so they become what me and Karen Agastam in our comparative study of Hindu nationalism and Zionism call facts on the ground. And they rely on emotional and material assumptions of linear historical narratives, which become objectified, verified and falsified and kind of narrated as truths with a past, present and future. But, but they also turn into these desires and imaginations of what Lacan has referred to as master signifiers of the nation, of the people, of the other, in ways that then secure this illusion of a stable self and an equally illusion of an equally stable other. So, so, so not only can walls, fences or border guards present actual barriers to people, but also the pure imagination of these historical and material impediments can provide a sense of security for those in search of solutions to everyday insecurities and existential anxieties. So, so in the populist rhetoric of far-right parties and movements, these imaginaries then become materialized in terms of reproduced and often gendered in gendered way, reproducing symbols, memories, myths and heritage, and then are given new political significance according to current needs and goals. So, so in the hands of far right leaders and movements, it is about channeling and governing emotions in its broadest sense for containing anxiety, for neutralizing anger, for alleviating guilt and for satisfying this imagined need for pride, attachment and, and pleasure. And especially nostalgia in these accounts becomes a, a means and often a very gender means again to guide future action while creating this illusion of ontological security in the present. So one could argue and that, that this at, at times of heightened tension and anxiety and a little bit similar to what Giddens talks about in society that populist discourse and narratives seem to resonate with an audience kind of beset by securing its everyday existence. So let me just take an example of the populist language of, for instance, the Sweden Democrats, which now props up the Swedish government, where we see how fantasies of the past conjure up images of not only a country free from migration, but also one untouched by global forces. So it entails this phantasmatic, fictional narrative of past greatness, transmitted then to new generations in search of answers to their own anxieties, while it simultaneously points to those who have taken this greatness away, the establishment, the immigrants. So, so in order to captivate an imaginary past, the Sweden Democrats, together with multiple other populist parties and organizations in Europe and elsewhere, have not only fabricated stories to allow for this kind of dystopic narrative of immigrant others to prevail, but also been intent on providing portraying past national sentiments as defined by harmony, by security, by coherence. And what we see also is how other parties, of course, have followed suit, which is very clear in the Swedish case. So the Sweden Democrats have insistence, for instance, on using traditional dress at the opening of the parliament. They have redefined the social democratic narrative of the people's home to account for what they refer to as the now lost opulence and welfare of earlier generations. And they have claimed that, even they claimed that the author of children's books, Astrid Lindgren, who is the author of Pippi Longstocking, would really have been a Sweden Democrat if she was born today. So, so this is also where the concept of home and, and by extension homeland comes in to describe the kind of emotional attachment to such a body politics in terms of a desire for fullness and, and completion. So as Jennifer Mitchell has argued in relation to how home works as a desire for ontological security, so home imagery facilitates imagining ourselves as belonging to groups, especially nations and states, which are then linked to homelands, the places where we live. So in other words, 
the idea of home operates at two levels, the micro level of the personal place to which we feel attached and the macro political level of the political projects that organize our lives and to which we feel we belong. So it's a notion of home then encompass concrete physical elements as well as spatial imaginaries and metaphors and they thereby kind of afford subjects a sense of being in place in time and space. So home, if only provisionally, is always a localizable idea and is generally framed through national lenses. At the same time though, and this is important, conceptions of home, home worlds and homelands are not foremost products of processing internal to self-contained forms of subject formation. Instead, as Kirsten Jacobsen argues, the price of our making ourselves at home in the world is that we make the world that we inhabit inhabit inhospitable to others. So it's also perhaps and even more crucially reinforces a kind of flawed conception and experience of the self, a kind of misrecognition in Lacanian terms, according to which the home might be related to and potentially inhabited as delimited and by the subject fully owned space. So, so this result in what Walters and others have labeled domo politics, that is the governing of the state at, at home and attempted domestication of groups and individuals who destabilize and erupt such a homely image. So attempts to contain and manage migration thus and this is my last sentence, thus represent evident conflations of nationhood, homeliness and threat. And I think I finished there. Thank you. OK, thank you so much, Katerina. Um, you touched on um, a lot of interesting points there about the relation to home, nationalism, signifiers used them by political parties, etc. to kind of promote this idea of ontological security at a macro level and then contrasting with the micro perspective as well. Um, so I'll just quickly introduce our next speaker. Um, we have Alexandria Innes here, or Andri as I call, call her. Um, so she is senior lecturer in, in international politics at City University of London. And she specializes in the international politics of migration. Um, theoretically, her research is situated at the intersection of migration studies and critical security studies. And she has published in various outlets, including international political sociology, security dialogue, geopolitics and international relations. She's also the author of two monographs, um, which are called Migration Citizenship and the Challenge for Security published in 2015 um, and more recently post-colonial citizenship and transnational identity in 2020. Although the first paper that I, I read from Andy was about British soap operas and how themes relating to migration um, and asylum seekers and migration politics uh, were brought up in in um, British soap opera series um, and I found it totally fascinating and um, so I'm really happy that that Andrew's going to speak today so um, if you can um, use your mic to, to go ahead that'd be great thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction Marcus and for the invitation and um, thank you Katarina as well I really enjoyed listening listening to you speak just now. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to follow the briefing that, that Marcus gave us. I'll talk a little bit about how I came to use ontological security theory and then move to sort of the particular insights and for migration studies in particular. Um, so I first encountered ontological security as a concept when I was a PhD student. I was taking a class on critical security studies that was offered by Brent Steele. And I didn't know much really about much um, but when I was taken when I first started this class and so I think that I moved towards ontological security theory was a sort of organic development more than an informed choice at, at that point um, so in this class it was a really great class we read chapters three and four of Brent's book on logical security and international relations and that was my first encounter with ontological security theory um, in the context of the class, uh, we read Karen Fiecki's Critical Approaches to International Security, we read Bill McSweeney's Security, Identity and Interest, and the sort of political sociology of security really appeals to me. I return to these texts all the time still, um, 
it was my first sort of real introduction to social theory in general, I think, apart from sort of little bits and pieces as an undergrad and not just to Giddens, but also Foucault, Bourdieu, Lacan. Um, it all kind of all my first encounters came through this class. Um, and I think ontological security theory really resonated because for me, my sort of constant point of entry into IR theory has been to question the state. And when I started researching, this was much more sort of instinctive than based on any knowledge. And then I was introduced to IR theory. I just couldn't understand or get to grips with the state as a concept, much less the reasoning behind assuming the state as a unitary actor. Um, it just didn't, I just couldn't make it make sense in my head. Um, and critical security studies then opened the door to interrogate that and introduced me to all this great research where people were doing exactly that. Um, and I think ontological security theory, the interest in identity and the concept of the self offered some insight that allowed me to kind of better understand these state centric or sort of state as agent arguments in a way that I just hadn't before. Um, so obviously Brent's work, but also um, Aisha Zarakol's work on state identity really helped me get to grips with this question of um, like endogenous and exogenous relational processes in the reproduction of state identity construction. Um, I think Marco Vera's work on post-colonial subjectivities and Katarina's work as well on religious nationalism and gender to um, these all sort of formed the foundation for my PhD research on experiential security and like migrant interactions with the state because it sort of helped me interact with the state and how it was constructed in, in IR as a concept. Um, and so I'm still not really comfortable working at the state level. So ontological security theory continues to offer a framework in which the individual or the community is legible and relevant in international relations. Um, and so this is something I've, I've kind of looked at this argument recently. It does well to break down the kind of false silo and of levels of analysis to allow for insight into interactions between them. Um, and thematically, I've just continued to pursue this sort of, I think of it as a category of people who don't have state-based identities. Um, and so I would kind of count myself in that category because I had a transnational family and an upbringing that didn't strongly identify with the state that where I grew up. And so that kind of set the foundations for me to kind of approach things in this way. Um, I think there's more to say about it in the context of social class and local identities, but thematically I've been constantly interested in migration and it was interest in migration and the sort of injustice of state based identities that brought me into international relations rather than reaching migration studies through IR. Um, so I tend to focus on people in insecure migration status, but I've looked more broadly or generalised some insight to transnational, post-colonial, hybrid, ethnic, local and diaspora identities, which I would all think fall into this kind of umbrella of non-state based identities. Um, and so and, and now I'm looking sort of at intersectionality and how that can advance theoretically the use of ontological security and IR. That's what I've most recently published on. Um, and I've got a couple of things that I'm hoping to develop further on that. Um, so, yeah, to move to the sort of key insights, I think um, ontological security theory as a starting point offers a means, um, like I already mentioned, of moving across and between what IR constitutes as the levels of analysis, but without having to sort of calcify or um, without having to calcify who or what constitutes the key actors. We can look at identity in multiple manifestations because ontological security theory interrogates that constitution of identity and the combination of narrative and relational approaches can put any community identity into sort of the same framework of analysis whereby threats to that identity have political implications. And then we can interrogate how and where power is attached to those identities um, or is acting upon those identities. I think that's important because for me, inequality is simultaneously a big driver of political violence and is also produced by political violence. So this adds some critical insight into the power structures that act upon our definitions of violence and inequality and the way different forms of violence might be measured and conceptualized and addressed in the world and how they act unequally on different identity groups. Um, I think this falls into questions of structure and agency. Um, and maybe I'm still too indoctrinated by Giddens, but I think ontological security theory sits somewhere between structure and agency, trying to understand the structural constraints on agency. And to do that, what you really have to know is how those structural constraints are interpreted by the agent self. And so that's kind of why I like the, the ontological security emphasis on identity narratives. And I think this connects as well to 
the emphasis on emotions. Um, so I include recent work on anxiety in this context of emotions. It adds further complexity to the more traditional focus on identities and identity narratives because it's key to that interpretation of the world by the self, the interpretation of how the agent self understands the structural world that constrains them, which is guided by emotion. And then emotion is also kind of a product of the structure too. Um, I'll mention briefly, I think an anxiety lens can sit with ontological security um, in two ways. And Nina Krikocho's work has been really, really helpful for me in this context. Um, I think initially I was sort of reluctant to um, get on board with the arguments um, that anxiety is a normalized condition. And then Nina's article from International Studies Review, I think it was um, in 2022, does this sort of survey of the various ways anxiety has been employed in on ontological security theory arguments to make sense of the contradictions, whether it can be characterized as synonymous with ontological insecurity, whether it's exceptional and neurotic, um, such as laying conceptualizes the divide itself, or whether it should be characterized as a constant sort of Lacanian lack. And I really recommend this article um, for insight on anxiety and, and kind of ways to reconcile the different approaches. I found it really useful. Um, so I'll move to how ontological security might enrich migration studies. This is kind of an interesting question for me because I think ontological security was used as a framework for analysis in migration studies in sociology, preceding it being embraced by international relations. Um, ontological security requires this complex understanding of identity and belonging and can offer insight into relationships and processes between individual and group identities. So I think the question is not just about how ontological security can enrich migration studies, but how the concepts being used and developed in IR and how this might be reflected back into migration studies. Um, and so for me, it's still about identity, but it's within that framework of the disruption, um, particularly in cases of forced migration or migration without state authorization, the disruption of the citizen state relationship that tends to govern how we understand forms of international belonging or like, access to international and national frameworks of human rights, human security and social security. So the citizen state relationship controls access to state provided resources that make everyday and experiential security, things like social services, healthcare, education, employment that comes with worker protections. And so this is the area where I'm, I'm currently working. I think this sort of intersects quite nicely with um, Katarina's work as well. I'm sort of looking at the experiential side and where these narratives that kind of produce the security narratives of state identity are then acting upon experiential security. Um, so migration has this significant link to security. Um, and it's a, it's a political issue that necessarily transcends the level of analysis in IR. So people might remove themselves from their state jurisdiction, this citizenship jurisdiction, or be removed or seek entry to another or be within another, another but see their rights changing as government changes. Um, and often a government that immigrants have no ability to elect or hold accountable. So migration studies always requires an approach that isn't locked into a particular sort of say state system individual silo because as a concept, it always necessarily traverses and interacts at different levels. Um, so ontological security is um, key to, to understanding the relationship between experiences of security that are internal to the state or transcend state boundaries, and then how these are understood, controlled, withheld, and weaponized by states. The state's often still very relevant to those experiences of security because of the power it holds in interactions to make or unmake experiential security. So in a recent project, um, I'm looking currently at where hostile environment policies restrict access to support services for migrant women, and um, to understand this as a form of weaponizing insecurity li linked to domestic violence. Um, so internal to states as well, migrant communities complicate how state identity works. I think the UK is a very interesting example because of colonial history. It's not the only example like that, but the way that people identify with state narratives of security and identity is fragmented or incohesive at state, society, community and individual levels. And since ontological security can unpick these narratives, it's really useful. Um, but for me, it's most useful if we continue to think about where power lies in constructing those narratives and looking to identify pushback and contestation to these strong narratives that are making and remaking the exclusionary identity that's key to definitions of security. So again, I think I'm intersecting with, with Katarina's um, work as well there. 
Um, so I think this can feed back into migration studies and sociological approaches, particularly in practical empirical and participatory action research. And Marcus, I think your work in particular um, really shows how a political sociology of ontological security and identity can kind of foster identity communities, can trace that process and context of identity making, and then speak back to, by doing that, speak back to the insecurities that are driven by state power-based identity discourses. So on that note, I'll hand it back over to you, Marcus. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks so much. That was really interesting. Um, um, and you've been speaking a lot about how these kind of different um, levels of narratives kind of intersect with, within ontological security studies um, at the state level and the micro level. And that was the kind of approach that I was using in my PhD research. So I was looking at the experiences of young adult migrants in Scotland and how they related to narratives about immigration politics um, in the country. And in Scotland, immigration politics are generally quite positive and we present Scotland as open and welcoming, inclusive. Um, and when the participants spoke about their experiences of discrimination or racism that they'd faced, uh, they often um, adapted their stories or used kind of coping mechanisms to better align themselves with this macro uh, narrative um, because otherwise they kind of may have felt themselves to be outside of the Scottish uh, self identity um, and that was kind of the perspective that I was taking in, in my study and in that sense um, the kind of ontological security of the self had this silencing effect on the minority group or there was it kind of limited the possibilities for being critical um, in that environment. Um, so moving on from from those kind of considerations, um, I had a specific question for, for each of you um, before um, we take some more questions from from the audience as well. If you can think of your questions and write them in the chat, that would be great. Um, Katerina, first of all, to you, um, your recent work has looked more at international political trends and particular um, moments or times of crisis. Um, and you've looked at the rise of author authoritarian populism and ontological insecurity in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic and the so-called migration crisis as well. And I was wondering why you think that ontological security theory is particularly well suited to studying these moments of crisis. Um, yeah, thank you, Marcus. Uh, I mean, I think for, for many reasons, I mean, I think if, if we go back to uh, Giddens, I mean, I, I do think Giddens is, is right when he talks about, you know, that we, these kind of, that it is at particular times when things get disrupted. I mean, he talks about it in some sense in the language of modernity, but I think we can talk about this in the language of rapid change in, in more generally. And, and what I kind of, perhaps would like to problematize a little bit Giddens is that, is that in Giddens terms, crises are often have a beginning and an end. I think we, we need to think of crisis as a more, something perhaps more lasting also, something that is, you know, that may not, we can think of gender violence, for instance. I mean, something that is a crisis that kind of goes on and how people deal with these continuous crises, you know. So, so and I think there is where ontological security comes in very handy, or very handy, but comes in, nicely both in terms of understanding the kind of emotional governance of political leaders. You know, if we looked at the COVID crisis and we looked at how political leaders were acting in some sense to provide this kind of security to, to the masses and to the people and how that was done in particular nationalist way, perhaps, you know, and even nativist way sometimes. And where you had this you know, pointed out these enemies who were responsible for the COVID crisis, who was responsible, was it, you know, a particular people, for instance. Uh, so, so I think it comes in very, but it also comes in to understand, because what I'm really interested in is that I'm interested in understanding why certain, why people have become attached to certain narratives rather than others. And that's where the kind of emotional component comes in, you know, that this kind of, 
a feeling of sense of, of safety, somebody who can provide you, even if it is built on misinformation, disinformation, uh, fantasies, lies, but can provide that kind of emotional attachment. Uh, and I think uh, the crisis, I know we talk about different crises, climate crisis, economic crisis, social crisis, political crisis, you know, so, and war and conflict. But, but in those particular times when everything is in some sense a little bit turned upside down, uh, we, we, this kind of emotional dimension of, of a crisis becomes very clear. And I think that's where ontological security comes in, you know, in a sense, to, to provide a sense of security by promising a sense of wholeness to a, an identity, which of course is, there's always something, every time you recognize an identity, you always misrecognize it as well. There's always something left outside, but it is the power of recognize, recognition that I think is very clear in ontological security studies. Okay. Yeah, thank you. It wasn't an easy question, so I, I appreciate your answer there. And Andre, um, just again to say that I found your your 2020 book where you trace the transnational life history of, of your grandfather moving from from Cyprus across to, to the north of England is really fascinating. So you, you use his story to kind of trace um, immigration narratives and um, political trends through the time that, that he moved over and through his life history um, and it was a really innovative perspective to draw to draw this all um, from, from your family history as well um, and in your research you talk a lot about performative security and the relationship um, that agency plays within this um, and I wondered if you could maybe uh, briefly briefly uh, summarize what, what you mean by this performative security and, and its relationship to ontological security. That's a good question. I hope I can. <laughs> um, and so I think um, thinking about the, the performative security um, in the context when I first used it was in it, this kind of came out of my PhD research and in, in, in the, the the first book I wrote, um, which sort of came from the, the research from that project as well, that was looking at how um, people who were seeking asylum in Europe were experiencing security. So I, I had this real experiential approach. Um, and what I found really interesting about that was looking at kind of the, the practices, the way that people sort of made security. There was this big disconnect between how the state was sort of conceptualizing asylum seekers even, sort of conceptualizing this identity that people were supposed to assume to, to guide their actions that would guide the state would sort of assume what their experiences of security should be. And then in those, um, in the kind of interviews I did in the participatory action research I did where I was sort of embedded within um, within these different organizations in Greece for a while and in the, the northeast of England as well, looking at how it was very different, how people kind of made and practiced their own security. And I felt like that offered an insight that couldn't kind of be extracted other than by sort of listening to narratives and by kind of um, how, how to sort of frame it by kind of being embedded and understand how people were practicing security in everyday life and by doing that I really kind of got an understanding of how that was very different from kind of what this, the parameters on that the state put on security even in terms of the resources that the state was deploying kind of supposedly to help people, which often were navigated in such a way that they they weren't helpful at all. Um, so I think that's kind of the entry point into it. When I got to looking at um, my granddad's narrative in, in this second book, I think the thing that was so interesting to me was particularly how he navigated citizenship. And I think it said some things about, um, it, it said some things about, uh, these non-state based identities um, kind of being in, in in discourse with citizenship or having to constantly navigate what that citizenship means um, because his, his citizenship status had a massive impact on kind of his life. This was really interesting to me and I wanted to be able to kind of understand it in a way where I could convey how interesting this was to me, which obviously it was, it was kind of a very sort of personal story 
into the context of why it should be interesting for international relations theory. And ontological securities offered that because of the narrative approach, because of the sort of way we look at state narratives and these kind of discursive narratives of security and how they're built attached to identity within the state, this kind of disjuncture in terms of how he, as a as a colonial citizen, because I, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of brushing over this and, uh, you know, I'm sure that not many people have read the book, but, um, his experience as a as a colonial citizen, he was a British citizen for his entire life. But because the citizen, the, because Cyprus went from being during his lifetime a colony to an independent state, at which point he had already moved to the UK, which was meant to be a temporary move um, for work, and he ended up staying a long time. But then he got conscripted into the UK military, and so it's this kind of different point at which he had to sort of navigate. Um, his citizenship being very, very different from his identity. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if I've answered the question, but I've, I've, I've waffled on for a while. So. That's great. Thank, thanks so much, Andrew. Um, just to, to say to the audience again, um, if you have any questions that you want to pose to either or both of our speakers, that you could write those in the chat um, and then we will deal with those um, shortly. I have one more um, question that I can feel to to both of you, whoever would like to take it. Um, I was uh, ontological security theory has been criticised um, sometimes for overemphasising the importance of continuity. Um, so continuity in time in terms of biographical narratives and in terms of everyday routines. Um, and so. Some some critics have argued that there's an overemphasis on this continuity and that it maybe um, overlooks the potential for positive disruptive change and adaptation um, in everyday life by by individuals and also by states. Um, and I wondered um, how how you would respond to those kind of uh, criticisms. You want Ka Katerina? Me? Would you? Okay. Yeah, I I can start. I mean. We, me and Jennifer uh, bring up those crit the criticism in some of our uh, special issues and and the way I deal with them. I mean, I, I think there is a... It is one thing to say that people perhaps try to imagine themselves as whole people. There is a different thing to say that this is something that exists. And I think the critique is a little bit problematic in that sense, because I think it reads sometimes ontological security as if we believed, I mean, some of our, our ontological security schools, that there is such a thing as a concrete, complete, full identity. And I don't think most of the ontological security work does that, actually. And I think when we talk about biographical narrative, I mean, what is important here is, of course, that biographical narrative always comes at the exclusion of other narratives and that they can rest on different levels of inclusion and exclusion in relation to you know nation borders memory gender and and of course the more such biographic narratives are are contested the more difficult it may be to keep them up which which is also part of explaining the more kind of what i talk about the liberal tendencies at enforcing such narratives in in the light of questioning and resistance um so but at the same time, I think the bibliographical narratives are not only built on relations to others. I mean, they are built on relation to recreating, reconstructing a past, reconstructing a past that kind of brings together the past, present and, and, and the future. So they are related to redefined and contested memories of self-conception. So they're never just there, but they're continuously objects of, of contention. So, so my main um, kind of trying to deal with this question is that I think there are, it's um, sometimes a little easy reading or sloppy reading sometimes perhaps of, of how ontological security has, has, has dealt with the question. And, and that comes back to how we look at, you know, and there is a debate between kind of existentialism and, and psychoanalysis as well. I mean, in the sense of how we look at the notion of self. And, and to me, a notion of self always has to be a kind of anti-foundational notion of self, you know, something that is constantly being renegotiated, reframed, and that it is about identification and not about, uh, you know, identity as such. It's identification that we then 
tend to believe that these are whole identities, a nation, nationalist identity or, or religious identity or something like that. So, and I think that's also a critique against Giddens. I mean, because I do think that sometimes Giddens conflates self-identity. He talks about self-identity as if it was the same. And that's another critique that has been brought up, that people tend to conflate self and identity. And I think it's important here to talk about identification as, as a kind of response to that particular critique. So, so I think one needs to think a little bit, is it a fair criticism in the first place? And I think perhaps sometimes, but perhaps not always. So that would be my immediate response. Uh, thanks, thanks so much. Um, and I think um, it relates a lot to how you kind of conceive of, of ontological security as this process, ongoing process of, of becoming secure. So it's not maybe something that's achievable, but it's rather an ongoing an ongoing thing. Um, I've just uh, seen some questions we have in our Q&A section, so apologies that I, I didn't bring those up earlier. Um, the first one is from Eugene, who asks, how do you differentiate between countries with pre-existing institutionalized diversity like South Tyrol or Lebanon and those which are diverse informally? And this is particularly important when dealing with labour immigrants and refugees. You want to have a go, Andrew? Um, I mean, what I would say is if I was going to kind of start off, a, you know, having a framework, I'd want to kind of understand how ontological security is constituted within the particular you know, what's the narrative of security and how does that relate to diversity within the country or to different identity groups within the country? Um, you know, in the, in my case, I've sort of looked at where there's this kind of narrative of security that is maybe um, based on an exclusionary identity. Um, so I'd ask, you know, do, does that exist? What does the narrative of security look like um, to then kind of navigate how I'm going to go about um, looking at either looking comparatively across countries and looking at what these distinctions look like. So, I mean, I can't answer the question specifically about these countries, um, but that's what that would be my starting point. I'd look at kind of where what the narrative of security is doing um, in terms of understanding how how it's dealing with diversity. Is diversity an integral part of the identity framework of the country? Is it institutionalized in the sense that it's embedded within the identity narrative or is it not kind of reproduced it's reproduced as something separate and distinct all the time in which case you know that's it, that's going to be doing something different i think that's kind of how i would approach such a question i can perhaps also i mean i think it's a really interesting question and i I'm thinking of it. I mean, you could, instead of using what is Lebanon you used, I mean, I could think of India as a, you know, a very, very diverse um, ca uh, country, but still, in some sense, you know, relying on kind of colonial constructions of what the nation is. And so, so in that sense, you know, I mean, it's a, a powerful kind of European narrative. I mean, from the Enlightenment, in some sense of of thinking of of nations as, as being homogenous, so thinking of them, even if they are very diverse, you know, thinking of them as, as one people, one country, one language, perhaps one religion, despite the fact that most, even if we look in Europe, uh, countries are much more diverse than, than that. So, so, so to me, more interesting is how, how is this kind of idea of, of um, the nation or nationhood or home, how is that kind of has been also used in, in kind of colonial structures and how what kind of impact did this have in some sense in in other parts outside the global north, you know, in, in a sense. So so I think we can think of it in similar terms, but just uh, with different kind of um, understanding of the kind of post-colonial gender racial structures in, in place and how ontological security comes in as a kind of, in some sense, as a, as a kind of a security provider, you know, from from the state. So mobilizing on different different um, levels or different kinds of identifications, I would say. So. OK, thanks so much. Um, the next question has two separate parts to it, and it's from my colleague Andrea. Um, and in the first part, he asks, um, there are different markers of diversity, including um, religious or language markers, um, on whereby 
uh, marker of diversity come, becomes linked to search for ontological security. Um, and he's asking why in some cases um, a marker is language while in others it might be religion, etc. How does this come to be? Um, so that's the first part of the, the question. And the second part is, could you explain the relationship between ontological security and societal security, which also considers identity? Um, so we could break it down into two parts. Um, Andrew, do you want to have a go at the first part? <laughs> So just to be clear, the first part is um, on what on what basis is a marker of diversity come to be? Does it come to be linked to the search for ontological security? Yeah, to that's be, true. Yeah, become insecure. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, again, I think to to start to think about that for me, I'd be looking at. Um, And how the state sort of consolidating power embedded in a in an identity narrative. Um, and so I think that, you know, if, if state power's been embedded in an identity narrative, that's often exclusionary. I think that's kind of why we see a lot of kind of anti-immigrant discourses or, or discourses that are um, oppressive of other markers of diversity. Um, I think it's a lot to do with how threats constituted within within a particular country. Um, so, you know, if that threat's based on religion more so than migration, then that's maybe where it's going to be sort of produced as a, a marker of threat or a marker of insecurity within an identity narrative. Whereas, um, you know, there's going to be a difference versus different contexts. So, again, I think, you know, you need to know a little bit more about context to be able to understand why any given marker of diversity becomes linked to ontological security or ontological insecurity. Um, and yeah, look at looking again to this sort of narrative, this discourse of security that's um, coming from the state or that's consolidating power for the state in a particular way would be the starting point. Um, and there'd be various ways that you could do that, looking at a public discourse or looking at um, experiential security and how people have um, navigated the state or have um, or have um, resisted state power in different ways. OK, that's great. Thanks for the, the answer to a difficult question. Um, Katarina, do you want to try the second part? So an explanation of what's the, the difference between ontological and societal security? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. I think it goes back to, I mean, a lot of people who write on ontological security, especially in, in IR, at least in the beginning, did it in the framework of trying to understand what does ontological security do differently than other security studies. So, for instance, the Copenhagen School, the Aberystwyth School, the Paris School. Um, and, and I think in comparison to both at least Aberystwyth School and perhaps if you think about societal security and, and securitization literature of the Copenhagen School, um, to me at least, it brings it brings emotions. It brings um, it brings into focus more of um, a kind of link, I think, between the individual and the society and the state and perhaps even the global you know so so there is something that i think when it's in the and also in the securitization literature i mean we are mostly cons interested in securitization as a speech act you know we are interested so it's a different kind of focus also on what how we study societal security in the Copenhagen School as how we study it in in the ontological security study so so I think to answer that question you have to think about what has been done in the other schools so to speak and I think the Paris School in that sense comes perhaps I mean Heusman Heusman was also like you were saying Andre was probably one of the first work in 1998 when he wrote, wrote on ontological security and migration so in before it was picked up by the by IR and I think uh, comes close so that has also kind of more Foucauldian understanding of, of, of security. So so in that sense, perhaps not paying enough attention to the more individual level. And I think the individual so to, in, in the matter that we talk about that there is there are things like attachments, there is things like fear, there is things like hate, uh, love, you know, emotions that are, you know, being mobilized. 
in different ways and it could be mobilized on the way of you know language or religion or you know so depending on like andrew was saying the power structures within the society themselves so so i would say that it brings uh, another layer and you then move it in a more post-colonial direction or it brings in a kind of power structure in relation to to colonialism and Eurocentrism and imperialism. If you bring it to a more gender notion, it brings in kind of gender into the ontological security studies that perhaps wasn't done properly in, in securitization theory. And if you bring it to the psychoanalytical level, you bring in the unconscious, you bring in those, you know, how can we understand these kind of the, the interlinkage between the unconscious and the conscious level and, and in terms of then moving from the individual to the societal to the state level without committing some kind of psychological reductionism. So I think that's what, how I would think of it. Thanks. Okay, great. Thanks for, for your answer. I think that's us um, just at the end now. We're on the hour mark um, and I just want to thank you both again for giving your time and sharing your, your experience of using the theory and I think it's been like a really insightful session drawing on a really broad um, a broad base of research so thanks a lot um, and thanks to the audience for tuning in and for posing some questions as well so that's great. Thank you Marcus. Yeah thank, thank you Marcus. You. Thanks. Bye bye. Okay bye bye. Okay. Bye. Bye.